The broadcast is now starting. All attendees are in listen-only mode. Good afternoon, everyone. This is Jessica Shipley with the Regulatory Assistance Project, and I'd like to welcome you to today's webinar on funding roadway infrastructure in an electrified world. We're glad you could join us for a discussion of this timely topic today. In recent years, fuel taxes and other mechanisms have not been keeping pace with the increasing costs of building and maintaining our transportation infrastructure. The growing number of electric vehicles on the road will contribute to this challenge. But as we'll hear about today, the United States has experienced transportation funding shortfalls for decades. And the gap between revenue and need in the transportation system existed before EVs were on the market. And also, we know that electric vehicles are going to be a key part of any successful strategy to reduce greenhouse gas emissions in the transportation sector, which is essential to meeting the climate imperative that we face. Our presenters today will share some insights into the way our current roadway infrastructure funding system works, the underlying causes of roadway and highway costs, and some options to consider for recovering revenue from EV drivers. Today I'm joined by two colleagues from RAP, Mark LaBelle and Jim Lazar, and we're delighted to also have with us today Karen Glitman of the Center for Sustainable Energy. CSE is a 23-year-old national mission-driven nonprofit that administers clean transportation and built environment programs. So before we get going in earnest, I just want to explain a couple logistical points. Uh, there are a large number of you, so we're keeping you muted, but you can submit questions and please do in the chat box and we'll do our best to get to them at the end of the presentation. The webinar is going to run for 60 minutes, but we will stay for an additional half hour if there are more questions. And also you should know that we're recording this webinar so that others who can't be here today can listen to it later. And we'll be sending you a link uh, to that recording and to the slides in just a few days. So with that, I will hand this over to Karen to tell us about the current landscape of highway funding. Thank you. Good afternoon or good morning. Uh, thank you for that introduction. Just a few more words about the Center for Sustainable Energy. CSE manages statewide, regional, and utility electric vehicle and electric vehicle infrastructure programs in Connecticut, New York, Massachusetts, and California, and will soon be launching in Oregon. CSE also administers the California Solar on Multifamily Affordable Housing and Self-Generation Incentive Programs. CSE prides itself on its program administration, rebate processing, and the data analysis which informs it. CSE's scale and reach are all in service to our mission to decarbonize transportation and the built environment in order to create sustainable, equitable, and resilient transport buildings and communities. Today, I'm going to provide some data points on the current structure for funding the transportation system, highlight the existing needs in the transportation system, and then bring electric vehicles into this context. The young climate activist Greta Thunberg has reminded us why this work is important. She says we need to act like our house is on fire, because it is. Governors and mayors around the country have set goals, signed on to commitments, and are beginning to act to reduce greenhouse gases. Emissions from the transportation sector, as shown on this slide, are the greatest source of greenhouse gases in the U.S. To decarbonize our economy, we must decarbonize transportation. And within the transportation sector, 59% of those emissions come from all of us driving and riding around in light duty vehicles. We need to accelerate the electrification of the transportation system and electric vehicles are a critical path to doing so. Addressing the challenge of both accelerating transportation electrification and funding the maintenance and preservation of the transportation system is today's topic. So what is the transportation system? The transportation system is comprised of a number of transportation modes, rail, air, maritime, transit, bike and ped, for example. For today's presentation, we are talking only about funding for surface transportation. Another way the transportation system is broken down is by whether it is people, or goods that are primarily being moved. These distinctions are helpful when considering revenue options to maintain the surface transportation system, that is the roads, bridges, sidewalks, and bike lanes that most of us use daily. I also want to distinguish today's conversation about 
funding for the transportation system from financing. Consideration of transportation financing, often called innovative financing, began in the 1990s and was in response to inadequate resources to maintain the surface transportation system. This underscores that the need for additional revenue to maintain our infrastructure is not new. It is also helpful to understand the current source of revenues to support the system. While the gas tax at the federal and state level get a lot of attention, gas tax revenues represent less than 30% of total revenues used to support the transportation system. Other user charges, such as vehicle taxes and fees and tolls, represent an additional 20% of all revenue. Combined, these user charges are just under 50% of the revenue supporting the transportation system. General fund appropriations at the federal, state, and local level represent about 20% of the total revenue. And I'll return in a bit to the federal general fund appropriations shortly. Property taxes, bond proceeds, and other non-user taxes and fees provide an additional 30% of total revenue. So how did we get here? The very first gasoline tax of one cent was imposed in 1932 by Herbert Hoover to deal with deficits created by the Depression. There were also gas taxes to help pay for World War I and the Korean War. But the institutionalization of the gas tax occurred with the establishment of the Highway Trust Fund. And as you can see, the federal gas tax has not been raised in 26 years. If 18.4 cents had been indexed to inflation, it would be about 32.6 cents today. One penny of the federal motor fuel tax provides the trust fund with between 1.5 and $1.7 billion a year. If the gas tax had been indexed to inflation, there would be an additional $22 billion a year in the highway trust fund. Revenue for the transportation system has remained fairly constant with a slight uptick created by the 31 states and the District of Columbia that have raised their gas tax in the last five years. Now, when you consider the needs identified by the American Society of Civil Engineers, there is a nearly $1 trillion existing funding gap for our roads, bridges, and transit system. This gap did not appear overnight and has been building for many years. I'm trying to think there should be another slide showing now. There we go. This widening gap between revenue and needs exacerbated by increased construction costs and increasing fuel efficiency of vehicles, which of course corresponds to less gasoline taxes being paid, are underlying flaws in the current funding structure. And this, as I mentioned, has been going on for a while. In the 1990s, I mentioned the attempts at finding innovative financing solutions to address the delta between revenue and need. And again, that was a symptom of these underlying flaws in the system. And then in 2007, when federal commitments to fund transportation could not be met with highway trust fund revenue, general fund appropriations were made to the highway trust fund. These general fund transfers are now baked into the surface transportation law and are expected to continue beyond the current surface transportation authorization, which goes until 2020. As you can see from this chart from the Federal Highway Administration, from 2008 to 2018, more than 114 billion has been transferred from the general fund to the highway trust fund. The user pay model has been broken for quite some time. Now, the gap between revenue and need in the transportation system, as I mentioned, existed long before electric vehicles entered the market. The now 1.2 million plug-in vehicles on the road today represents about one half of 1% 1 of the 275 million light-duty vehicles on America's roads. The gap in revenue was not created by electric vehicles not paying a gas tax equivalent. And of course, as mentioned, electric vehicles provide additional energy, climate and health benefits. As you can see from this map from the National Council of State Legislature, electric vehicle fees have been created in many states. And in some cases, those fees were the state's only legislative activity on EVs. 
These fees are usually in addition to the excise and registration fees and range from $50 to $200. Now that's in comparison to the average fossil fuel car, which pays about $146 a year in gas taxes. It's interesting to note that three of these states are dedicating a portion of these EV fees to support electric vehicle infrastructure, thus also encouraging EV ownership. So what's the government to do? It has a funding system that did not keep up with inflation based on a fuel that 24 governors have pledged to reduce. Now, while EV owners don't pay a gasoline tax, in states that impose a systems benefit charge or a public benefit fund or taxes on the electricity they use, EV owners pay those charges. Now, this map does not reflect all the states that have some utility-based assessments, such as Washington State. But for instance, in my home state of Vermont, the average electric vehicle would generate approximately $60 in systems benefit charge annually. Now, electric vehicles, of course, are reliant on both the transportation and electricity system. So might there be a way to transition to a volumetric charge on electricity to fund the transportation system as well as continuing to support the electricity system. As the electricity and transportation sectors merge, transdisciplinary language and common goals are needed to meet shared commitments to reduce greenhouse gas emissions while ensuring vibrant and healthy communities and people. And a well-maintained transportation system is critical to that. So I'm now gonna turn it over to Mark, who's gonna get into some more information on the cost allocation. Thank you. Thanks, Karen. Thanks very much for that context and for teeing up all those issues. Um, as she said, we're going to hand this over to Mark Lobel, who's going to tell us about the drivers of roadway costs. And please pardon that pun. <laughs> um, thanks, Jess, and thanks, Karen. Hi, everyone. My name is Mark Lobel. Uh, I joined RAP recently this past February. I'm happy to be with you all today. Um, so to start off, the question is, why should we be looking at the, the causes of road costs? To the extent that there are are as a need for new contributions from electric vehicles to public funds beyond the taxes and fees that EV drivers already pay, we should be looking to solutions that are both fair and efficient. One frame for looking at these questions is the underlying causes, or drivers, so to speak, of building and maintaining roads and highways. Of course, there are other important factors to consider when imposing fees and taxes, including environmental and public health impacts and broader equity considerations. In principle, transportation can be funded entirely through income taxes or carbon pricing, but as long as we are operating at least partially on the user pays principle, then cost causation is a good place to start on both efficiency and fairness grounds. Uh, transportation agencies have been looking at the drivers of road construction and maintenance costs for a long time. These are known as cost allocation studies, some terminology that will be familiar to those of us who work regularly in utility regulation. Um, we have a Washington State study that goes all the way back to 1977. The latest federal study was in 1997. But there's more recent work on this topic too, including in Oregon, where there's a study conducted every two years. Oregon has a constitutional amendment requiring that revenue must be generated in a manner that ensures that the share of revenues paid for the use of light vehicles, including cars, and the share of revenues paid for the use of heavy vehicles, including trucks, is fair and proportionate to the costs incurred for the highway system because of each class of vehicle. There are four main categories of drivers of roadway costs, both for construction and for maintenance. Uh, those categories are vehicle width, wider vehicles need wider roads, vehicle weight, heavier vehicles need stronger roads and do more road damage, miles driven, also referred to as vehicle miles traveled or VMT, and then the time and location of travel. Congestion drives the peak capacity needs for roads. There are others, of course, but they tend to be smaller. Some of these causes operate jointly. For example, Oregon happens to have a peak period passenger car equivalent VMT allocator. That combines VMT with the relative size and weight of vehicles, as well as a measure of peak period usage. So we'll start with weight and width, which are both major determinants of roadway cost. Large trucks like the Freightliner E Cascadia are very wide and heavy and are responsible for very wide lanes on many roads, such as freeways, plus the cost of building stronger roads and the associated maintenance. 
In areas where tractor trailers don't drive, key parameters of some roads are set by the need for access for fire trucks, buses, or trash pickup. Otherwise, roads can be sized primarily for passenger vehicles. If we all drove little cars like the Fiat 500E, lanes could be very narrow in many places, and bridges wouldn't need to bear as much weight. The additional cost of wider lanes, including land acquisition, construction, and maintenance, is due to wider vehicles. Pavements and structures could also be less rugged in various ways if we all drove smaller vehicles. The Tesla X, like many other SUVs, is a foot wider and 2,000 pounds heavier than the 500E. These vehicles are responsible for a greater share of roadway cost per mile driven than very small cars. Existing fuel taxes track weight and width well because heavier vehicles use more fuel, all else equal. Wider vehicles typically weigh more and can be less aerodynamic and use more fuel as a result too. A VMT fee, if it's adjusted for weight and width, can also track weight and width, but there are administrative challenges that Jim will get to. An annual fee, if adjusted for weight and width, can also account for some of these factors as well. Uh, next, we have miles driven or VMT. A short range electric vehicle, like an early Nissan LEAF, can't go more than 100 miles on a charge. A Nissan LEAF will likely be driven less than a Tesla 3 as a result, because the modern Tesla 3 has 250 miles of range in each battery charge. Um, a vehicle driven as a taxi or rideshare operation will often travel up to five times as many miles per year as one used for personal transportation. Obviously, a fuel track tax tracks miles driven, um, and it also tracks weight and width, as we just discussed. A simple flat vehicle miles traveled tax tracks miles driven, of course, but unless it is adjusted for weight and width, it doesn't track those cost drivers. Lastly, time and location of travel impacts the peak design capacity for roads, as well as congestion costs. Of course, the construction and design of roads influences a number of decisions by drivers and potential drivers, including where people live, how many cars people own, where businesses are located, and whether public transit is a preferred option. For example, expanding highways, which can reduce congestion in a static sense and increase throughput, does have the impact of drawing more cars and users to that roadway in the short term and could attract higher populations to that area in the longer term. That's known as induced demand. Vehicle efficiency does go down when cars are slowed by traffic, meaning that existing fuel taxes do track congestion conditions somewhat. But for the most part, the gas tax doesn't track time or location of travel. Tolls are one mechanism that effectively prices usage of certain roads, which can be adjusted by time in principle. More comprehensive congestion pricing approaches have been pioneered in other countries and are beginning to be adopted in the U.S. as well. EVs pay tolls right now in most places, so that's not necessarily an area where EVs are advantaged relative to internal combustion engine vehicles. Great. Thanks, Mark, for laying out those factors causing roadway costs for us. With all of that in mind, we'll turn now to Jim Lazar to hear about some possible options for roadway taxing. Thanks, Jess, and, and thanks, uh, uh, Mark and Karen, for your great presentation. I've got the assignment of evaluating some of the options for roadway cost recovery that we've identified. These options include a fixed annual fee, which can be adjusted either to reflate width and weight or to reflect the vehicle battery size. A vehicle miles traveled fee, which can be adjusted to reflect weight and width. Directing existing electricity tax uh, paid by users of electric vehicles into the fund used for roads and directly taxing the electricity use by electric vehicles. The existing gas tax tracks weight, width, and miles traveled fairly well. As we'll later discuss, the same principle can be used for electricity. We can achieve the same linkage between cost causation and revenue. Heavier vehicles use more fuel and pay more tax. Wider vehicles use more fuel and pay more tax. And the more miles you drive, the more fuel you use and the more tax you pay. And when it's congested, your fuel economy goes down and you pay a little bit more tax per mile driven. But states are experimenting with other alternatives. 
A number of states have adopted fixed annual fees for EVs to support roadway costs. A little Fiat 500e pays the same fee as a big Atlas XT pickup that uses twice as much road. A fixed fee per vehicle does not track any of the cost drivers, width, weight, and miles traveled. If it were adjusted based on a vehicle's width and weight, it would be more accurate in tracking cost causation. One very simple and easily administered solution is to use the fixed fee approach, but make it dependent on the size of the battery in the vehicle. We know that information from the vehicle registration data, so it's no problem to administer. The theory is that wider, heavier vehicles need bigger batteries, and the people who drive long distances on electricity need bigger batteries to do so. I'll use an example of $3 per kilowatt hour of battery capacity per year. A plug-in like the Prius Prime with a 10 kilowatt hour battery would pay $30 per year, but would also pay the gasoline tax for all of the gasoline it uses. A mid-range car like the early Leaf, the VW Golf or the Kia Soul with a 24 kilowatt hour battery would pay $72 a year and a long range car like a Tesla 3 with the big battery would pay $225 a year. Does not directly track width, weight, and miles driven, but it comes a lot closer than an undifferentiated fixed annual fee for all EVs. Oregon has run a pilot vehicle miles traveled or VMT program for short called Orego. The cost is currently 1.8 cents per mile. This does not track weight or width, but does clearly track miles driven. A VMT fee is seen as intrusive by many users. Customers must either have an electronic monitor or else have periodic odometer readings. And this approach does not address interstate miles driven, only those in the state of registration. It would be no harder to implement a VMT fee that is tied to weight and width. For example, a penny a mile for a small car like a Fiat 500e, a penny and a half for a typical car like a Tesla 3 or Chevy Bolt, and two cents a mile for a large SUV or pickup that are both wider and heavier than cars and use more road. EV owners pay elect existing electricity tax on the electricity we consume. It's a significant amount of tax. Where I live, it's 13% of the price of electricity, 4% to the state and 9% to the city, and uh, up to a 5% system benefit charge, as Karen described earlier, that goes into electric public benefit programs. While many states have constitutional provisions that excise taxes on motor vehicle fuel must go to roads, we are not aware of any states calculating how much existing tax on electricity used by EVs properly belongs in the road fund and none that are actually making that transfer. It would be easy to estimate the amount used by each type of vehicle because the mileage is reported when they change hands or are inspected, and we, we learn how much each type of vehicle is driven per year. However, even though the electricity tax is a big part of the cost of electricity, it is still generally far lower on a per mile basis than the road tax on gas. And currently the electricity taxes mostly go into general government programs, paying for things like schools, police, and fire protection. Diverting this existing tax would not be easy politically. At this point, it's important to note that gasoline and diesel vehicles often do not contribute to general government costs. Most states don't impose sales tax on gasoline uh, or, or other general government taxes, while EVs generally do pay these general government taxes. In theory, we can directly tax the electricity that's used by motor vehicles. One challenge, however, is that the equal road taxes of one to two cents per mile driven, depending upon vehicle size and weight, 
the electricity taxes need to be somewhere in the three cents to six cents per kilowatt hour range. That would be up to a 50% surcharge on electricity prices in low cost states and about 15 or 20% uh, in most areas. This would probably encourage a, a form of tax evasion. Electric vehicle owners using a dumb charger connected to an ordinary 240 volt home circuit like those for our ranges, water heaters or air conditioners and clothes dryers to bypass uh, the uh, electricity for vehicles tax. This is where smart chargers like those being used in Minnesota's EV pilot program come in. Reporting to the utility the amount of power going into the EV and at what hours. The road tax can be applied to the EV usage, which is charged on a time of use basis, even if the rest of the house is served on a dumb rate for the time being without time differentiation. In order to make this option feasible, we would need an off-peak charging discount that is large enough to make the smart charger, shown here, advantageous for the user. And we can do that with smart rates. Most utilities today have pretty dumb electricity rates for residential users, the same price at every hour. These tell us to plug in the car whenever we get home and just let it charge. There's no incentive to charge at low cost or low emission hours. Uh, those are the hours when surplus wind or solar energy is increasingly available. A smart rate on the other hand, shown here on the right, would have a much, much lower off-peak rate and a much higher on-peak rate. Ideally with a sharp increase during the 20 to 100 critical hours per year when the electricity grid is straining. These provide a strong incentive to charge during the off-peak hours. And if the off-peak discount is high enough here, it's 12 cents for the dumb rate and five cents for the off-peak smart rate. Customers will choose a smart charger to take advantage of this, even if we are adding a three cents per kilowatt hour road tax for power flowing through the smart charger. So I've tried to compare all of these options against four criteria across the top here. The first, is it equitable? That is, does it track the cost drivers of width, weight, and miles driven? Second, is it administratively easy for states to do? Third, does it promote emissions efficiency? That is the use of electricity when it is cheapest and cleanest. And finally, does it address interstate issues? That is collect money from us when we are driving outside the state of registration. The gasoline and diesel tax does all of this quite well, except for emissions efficiency. There is no time when diesel fuel or gasoline are, uh, are, are emissions free. It does need to be adjusted over time to reflect fuel economy improvements and inflation. As Karen discussed, we haven't done that. And as we'll see, a fuel tax for electricity may also be a good choice. An annual fixed fee is a poor choice. Uh, well, it has high administrative efficiency. It fails all of the equity, emissions, and interstate criteria. If adjusted for weight and width, it's better, uh, but still not good. The same is true for an annual fixed fee tied to battery capacity. Certainly better than a flat fee, but not very good. An electricity tax is more promising than any of the other options. First, we can direct the existing tax on electricity to the roadway system as we do with diesel and gasoline taxes. Second, uh, we can impose a per kilowatt hour tax that will address the key drivers, weight, width, and miles driven, and also address interstate cost recovery, the interstate cost recovery challenge. But it's relatively easy to evade by connecting to an ordinary 240 volt outlet. Using an electricity tax combined with uh, smart charging, we can do a lot better. We can have fair cost recovery tied to weight, width, and miles driven. 
We're gaining experience in many states with EV specific tariffs and smart charging. It works for drivers, it works for utilities. Smart rates will encourage charging when costs or emissions are low as we add wind and solar to our grids. And because EVs do have to recharge where they are operating, it can address the interstate cost recovery issue. Well, thank you. I'm going to give it back to Jess now for some final thoughts, and we look forward to your questions. Great. Thanks, Jim, and thanks to all of our presenters. Um, let's leave you with a few final thoughts here before we transition to Q&A, and I hope you're getting your questions ready and typing them into the, the questions pane there on your screen. So we learned that the United States has experienced transportation funding shortfalls for decades. The failure to adjust our fuel taxes is the principal cause. Improved fuel economy is a minor cause, and electric vehicles have contributed very little to the current problem. Fair cost recovery for roadway infrastructure should be taking into account the drivers of those costs, primarily weight, width, and miles driven. There are some options for policymakers to consider going forward. In particular, smart chargers, smart rate design, and smart tax design can work together to provide an effective, efficient, and equitable solution. And finally, as all of our presenters have really touched on today, to find durable solutions to these challenges, we need planning of transportation and electric system to be better coordinated. And with that, I'm going to transition to some questions. Um, as I said, please submit them uh, through the GoToWebinar platform. We have a few um, teed up to get us started. Um, so, <clears throat> Jim, here's one for you um, that kind of gets at some of your vehicle miles traveled options. Would it be reasonable to collect road taxes at just say the 15,000 mile per year mark from each vehicle unless they choose to provide their actual VMT? Uh, if it were adjusted for weight and width, uh, having a default level uh, with a, a, a come in for a credit, if you drive less miles would be more fair to my neighbor, a, a teacher who has a 2011 Nissan Leaf and drives it about 5,000 miles a year. She could apply for, for that credit. However, at the other end of the spectrum, it would still be a terrific deal uh, for the uh, Chevy Bolt owner who operates that as an Uber vehicle and drives at 50,000 miles a year. There's one uh, uh, company in, in Los Angeles that uh, keeps its service records online and they uh, use Tesla S's for, for sedan car service. And they're putting 60, 70, 80,000 miles a year on those vehicles. Uh, so a, a flat fee uh, per year uh, is, is still, still kind of fails uh, the uh, fairness issue. And it doesn't provide any, any incentive by itself to, uh, uh, to charge the vehicles at low cost, low emission times. Okay. Thanks. Um, <clears throat> another one to um, sort of clarify some of the, the options that you presented. Please um, cover some of the different mechanisms of pricing VMT. What about congestion pricing and the likelihood that cities will be able to adopt uh, that type of pricing? I'll speak to the VMT part and ask Mark to speak to the congestion pricing part. Uh, yeah, this, so far, the Oregon and Washington experiments with VMT have been undifferentiated as to weight and width. They charge the Fiat 500E as much as they they charge the much larger, heavier vehicle, and and that sort of fails the uh, the, the fairness test. Uh, but as I said in the in the webinar, it would be very easy to adjust those to reflect width and weight, that is to, to be a different fee for different size vehicles, or to simply oppose, impose an annual fee based on battery size, which, which would sort of have the same kind of effect. Uh, we, we haven't yet seen uh, differentiation of the MT by, by weight and width. I'll, I'll now let Mark speak to the congestion pricing. Sure. Uh uh, obviously, as a, as a general matter, it wasn't possible to cover every single alternative in our in our presentation today. Um, and one reason that we we didn't talk about congestion pricing is that there's no 
truly logical reason to have a higher congestion fee for electric vehicles than other vehicles, unless your goal is just to collect additional revenue from EVs. If the point is to regulate traffic sensibly, then for congestion pricing purposes, an EV looks the same as, as any other vehicle. Um, you know, it, it's been a, a fairly popular electric vehicle policy in some states to exempt EVs from tolls, um, which in fact goes in the other direction from collecting additional revenue from EVs. Um, and that's a that's a pretty good incentive in many places to, to buy an EV. So the question of, of congestion pricing, um, you know, if there, you'd, you'd have to be collecting extra revenue from EVs under the congestion pricing scheme, um, which is not something we've really seen to date. Yeah, let me just add a little bit to that. Uh, California is most famous for exempting EVs from uh, from tolls and, and carpool lane restrictions. Uh, and it has been a major incentive for people to choose efficient vehicles. It was a overt policy choice to help achieve the state's goal at carbon reduction. Uh, and California is the number one market for electric vehicles. Uh, my brother unambiguously chose a vehicle that qualified for the 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 uh, use of the of the diamond lanes uh, when he was commuting there. Uh, and when, when he sold it, uh, it sold with a premium because it uh, had the uh, the carpool line stickers on it. So it's an incentive that works. Great, um, thanks. So this question I'm gonna toss over to Karen and then if you guys wanna add to it, um, feel free. How are other countries dealing with this dilemma and paying for their roadway infrastructure? And are there any kind of best practices that we've seen? Yes, I did some uh, looking at that uh, several years ago and found that it, it's very different outside of the US where in many European countries, the gasoline tax is actually uh, used for general fund activities and transportation is funded by general fund uh, fees as well. So they don't have that distinction between a transportation fund and a general fund. It's all one societal fund. Uh, so you see much more mixing of that. And of course, in European countries, as well as in, in Canada, you have a much, much higher gasoline tax not all of which goes to fund transportation. In fact, it funds many of the other programs as well. So it serves two goals in terms of uh, encouraging less use of fossil fuels by having a high tax and encouraging additional transit and walking and biking. Uh, but it also makes it clear that uh, the, the transportation system is actually a common good and benefits all. Uh, so I think what we've seen in, in other countries is a very different approach to the bifurcation of transportation from a societal good and it's actually one fund um, that is used to pay for transportation and the fees collected from the gasoline tax are just part of the general fund collection. Let me add just a little thing to that. In British Columbia, which has a carbon tax, that carbon tax is applied to the price of, of uh, motor vehicle fuels, uh, and then the carbon revenue is rebated to customers in the form of lower general government tax. So it has the, essentially the same effect that Karen described uh, for, for the countries that don't have a, a separate fund. Uh, and in California now, uh, under California's cap and trade legislation, the price of gasoline and diesel fuel does reflect the cost of California carbon allowances and those revenues are being used for an array of complementary measures uh, to reduce carbon intensity. Great, thanks. Um, here's a couple, I think that I'm gonna direct at Mark um, and then let you guys weigh in as well. Um, so there, it's about uh, medium and heavy duty vehicles. So could you talk a little bit how about how you would address the disproportionate impact of large trucks on roads and a related question would the smart taxation scheme work for medium and heavy duty vehicles like electric trucks so 
um, I, I think that existing gas and diesel taxes uh, track some of that to a certain extent. Um, the more the more fuel a, a large vehicle uses, the, the higher taxes they pay. Um, and the the any electricity tax scheme could could do the same thing. So I, I don't think that the electricity uh, tax on electric large electric vehicles necessarily raises any new issues on that that front. Um, to, you know, to the extent that you think that kilowatt hours used doesn't fully reflect the increased damage and other costs incurred by medium and heavy duty vehicles, you certainly could uh, try to implement some sort of a, a tiered um, electricity tax scheme. Um, you know, commercial and industrial um, accounts, you know, the utilities know which ones those are, and if large vehicles are charging at those accounts, it's possible that you could come up with a, a program that distinguishes uh, from light-duty vehicles charged at home. Yeah, a couple of things. Let me just add a couple of things to that. Uh, one is that our whole focus on weight, width, and miles traveled by its nature addresses the, 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 the heavy truck issue directly. Uh, the federal fuel tax addresses it as well. The federal gasoline tax, as Karen described, is 18.4 cents a gallon. But the federal diesel tax is 24.4 cents a gallon. Why the difference? Well, first, diesel fuel has more BTUs per gallon than gasoline, about 138,000 versus 110,000. And secondly, diesel vehicles use that fuel more efficiently uh, and tend to be heavier vehicles. Uh, and both of those justify an, an, a higher diesel tax than gasoline tax. And that's something that a number of states have, have really failed at. The, the federal tax is a pretty good model in that regard, even though it hasn't been in, adjusted for inflation for a couple of decades. Uh, turning to electric heavy vehicles, these electric heavy vehicles are going to require pretty darn specialized chargers uh, to get enough fuel into uh, the e-Cascadia that Mark showed uh, to handle a driver's shift, uh, you know, a 400 mile uh, uh, trip is to get that fuel in there, the electricity in there in an hour is about an 800 kW charging station. Electric buses are using 500 kW charging stations. Those are specialized chargers on very specific circuits. They're very identifiable in, ele in electric utility billing records by the nature of the, of the consumption. Uh, and I think it would be quite easy to apply an appropriate uh, differentiated uh, fee on heavy electric vehicle charging if it needs to be a different price per kilowatt hour than other electric vehicle charging. I don't think that's a, an administrative challenge. Okay, great, thank you. Um, here's one that I will maybe toss to Karen first and then um, whoever else wants to take a crack at it. Did, um, did we consider whether EV taxes and fees should account for environmental externalities? So the emissions benefits of EVs as compared to their alternatives. Yes, I mean, I think that was part of the, the messaging around some of the electric vehicle fees that we see states imposing, uh, which seem to be focused on trying to extract some sort of user element, user pays element from it, which does not take that, uh, the environmental health uh, benefits, air quality benefits, that come from EVs. So I think that is a missing piece on the transportation side. And yet on the electricity side, there are ways to account for those non-energy benefits um, more clearly in how you can set that structure. Okay. Jim or Mark, do you wanna to add to that? Well, I just note that the, for example, the California uh, carbon pricing requirement adds about 20 cents a gallon to the cost of gasoline, and that's obviously uh, charging a fee for the use of the atmosphere to polluting vehicles uh, has the effect of being a price incentive to use a non-polluting vehicle. 
Okay, here's one um, maybe for you, Jim, uh, regarding one of your options. How would an electricity tax be collected when the EV is charging outside of the home? For example, many Tesla owners are not charging at home and relying on supercharger stations. Would Tesla have to remit those taxes to the state in that case? Yes, any, any commercial high capacity charging station would have to remit the EV electricity tax uh, under the, uh, the option of, of that. And the high voltage DC charging stations are pretty easy to locate. Uh, they're probably uh, would be uh, some places where smart rates are not available or smart chargers are not installed. There's no off-peak discount or there's no off-peak usage. There, there will probably be uh, some evasion, just as right now, some gasoline that's destined for the marine market and doesn't have road tax on it winds up in cars and uh, some heating fuel that's not Tax with road tax winds up in diesel vehicles, but I, I think we could get you know 90 98 percent of it by taxing the uh, the high capacity charging stations. Okay, um, Karen and maybe Mark, how are um, other state other states funding public charging stations? So a question about actually EV infrastructure itself. Are those costs being paid by the state? by private investors or by ratepayers? I would say all of the above. Uh, so some states, I mentioned the three states that are using a portion of the electric vehicle fees to pay for EV infrastructure. Those are small dollar amounts. Many states have also uh, committed to using up to 15%, uh, the eligible 15% of their VW settlement to fund EV infrastructure. And then some states, uh, through proceedings at their PUC, are allowing utilities to place EV uh, charging stations. Some are doing the full run, some are just doing make ready. And then other states have created uh, programs uh, for EV infrastructure. So for instance, you know, California, which does have the cap and invest funds, are using funds to create EV infrastructure. They're also allowing utilities to put in EV infrastructure, in some cases, just make ready. So I think the answer is all of the above. And in some cases, you know, private companies are deciding that as part of their marketing pr promotion and attraction to their destinations, they're also putting in EV charging. Great, thanks. And this is kind of a related um, couple of questions that um, either Karen or Mark um, can take a crack at. Are you aware of deployment of smart chargers in utility service areas that are not yet served by AMI? And relatedly, how can we incentivize smart charger adoption? Rates send the proper price signal, but the upfront expense can be uh, prohibitive. Um, well, the, the, the programs for, for EV chargers do vary quite a bit. Um, you know, there are some simpler uh, EV uh, demand management programs which don't require full AMI. Uh, Rhode Island comes to mind. It has a simpler structure. Uh, but, you know, for, for states that have full AMI um, and are collecting that data from every customer anyway and are, are putting those meters out there um, for everyone, um, then then obviously AMI is just going to be out there. You know, the, the Northeast has a bunch of states that are in various levels of transition to AMI, so it's it's going to be more of an issue in in those places. AMI is is really not an essential element of smart charging and smart rates for EV charging, uh, because the smart chargers can carry that function. In the uh, pilot program underway now in in Minnesota, uh, XL Energy is installing smart chargers in houses that have dumb meters. And the dumb meter tells the utility that the house consumed 1,000 kilowatt hours during the month. And the smart charger tells the utility through the internet system that it's connected to that the EV charger consumed 300 kilowatt hours, of which 250 were in the off-peak period and 50 were in the on-peak period. 
and the customer gets a bill for 250 kilowatt hours on peak, 350 kilowatt hours off peak at the EV rate, plus 700 kilowatt hours for the rest of the house at the standard house rate. Uh, still a dumb meter. Still, a, you know, a, a, does not require AMI at all. Uh, but the smart charger can communicate the information that enables the customer to get the off-peak charging discount, would enable the state uh, to get the roadway cost contribution, uh, and the utility to get full compensation for the services it's provided. Uh, there, there, there's some pretty neat technology that can help us here. And I think just to the, the second part of that question in terms of how do we incentivize smart charging, I think looking at the beneficiaries of that data and that information, certainly utilities, uh, when they can set different rates to encourage charging at different times are a clear beneficiary. And if the consumer can benefit as well, I think looking at who the benefit beneficiary is can help you define and design uh, the incentive for the smart charging. So some jurisdictions are encouraging and allowing utilities to include incentives to place smart chargers. Um, so there's a, a whole range going on uh, in the country on how to incentivize it. Thanks. Um, this could be potentially for any of you. Um, is there anything to be done at the federal level here, or are we advocating for states to take this on on their own? So maybe I'll ask Karen first. Well, certainly from in terms of anything to be done here, if the here is talking about uh, funding for the transportation system, that is very much part of the federal discussion and and dialogue. And of course, electric vehicles are just a small, small piece of that much broader and more, you know, bigger uh, conversation. So we will see the next surface transportation uh, bill. Well, you know, there's, those conversations are beginning already. The current uh, authorization expires in 2020. Uh, there have been, you know, panels and commissions looking at how do we uh, fund transportation for a long time. I expect that that will those issues continue at the federal level. In terms of electric vehicle rate structure, I think that's going to end up being a state by state um, discussion because of the different regulatory constructs that you see in each state. Anyone else want to add on to that? Okay. Um, so this is a, a follow-up to Karen from the earlier question about what other countries are doing. Um, how are other countries, if, if you know the answer, um, dealing with the fair and efficient contributions of EVs when you factor in the climate problem? So where the internal combustion vehicles are you know, causing part of the problem, but the EVs are part of the solution. I don't know the answer to that. I haven't followed that at that level. I don't know if Mark or... Jim, have anything on that? Not immediately. Okay. Um, let's see. Here's just a kind you of know, a logistical. Because, oh, because yeah. we, we okay. have uh, we have another group of folks in RAP in Europe working on this. There, we should be able to get a response uh, back, at least individually, or to the to the group uh, on this later. Okay. Um, so, Jim, for the option of directly taxing electricity used by EVs, um, it seems it would greatly depend on where the owner lives and what utility serves them. Um, did did you have any thoughts about how to standardize this across a state that is served by a mixture of municipal co-ops and investor-owned utilities? Uh, I've thought about it. Uh, it's it's not an easy task, you know, getting at the the, the relatively small number of regulated utilities that serve about uh, three quarters of the of the customers is a more manageable task. But there's another couple thousand utilities that serve uh, the rest of us, and a lot of rural locations where EV charging will will need to be available. I I think that if I separate this into the home charging market, where I think there will be some challenges, and the commercial and high speed charging market 
where there will be a relatively small number of players. I think we can do the the commercial part of it. Uh, it's pretty administratively feasible, uh, but uh, there will, will be some challenges uh, getting smart charging and roadway cost recovery in place in small utilities. And it may be that states will need to uh, impose a general tax on electricity on those utilities that do not have uh, a mechanism in place to remit roadway costs. Uh, so that the, the utility would then have a choice of paying a, you know, a, a 3% tax on all of the electricity it sells or a 3 cents per kilowatt hour tax on all of the electricity uh, for electric vehicle charging that it sells and leave it up to the utility to decide w whether to uh, put the uh, uh, technology in place to isolate the electric vehicle charging. Mode. So it, it's worth at least mentioning that there are lots of other hybrid approaches here, but it would be possible to implement an electricity tax that's administered a little more like a VMT fee so that there has to be a reporting to a central mechanism that doesn't go through the utility. Um, so, you know, that's that's another option that could be discussed in some places, whether or not you'd want to mix and match utility run tax collection with uh, other central administration is, you know, could get even more complicated. But but there are, are ways to administer these different types of taxes and fees differently. Yeah, yeah, let me take this all the way back to the very first question we we, we took here, which is, could we just tax everybody 15,000 miles a year? Uh, and if they think they're entitled to something different, they can come in and uh, and apply for the uh, the rebate. Uh, and you know, the, it could be a fixed annual fee or a uh, uh, assumed uh, revenue per per kilowatt hour used for the vehicle based on standardized miles. And if the vehicle drives a different number of miles, uh, you could apply for a rebate. That that works adequately for uh, I think the most important uh, group here, which is the modest income folks. So you can you, know, you could buy a used Nissan Leaf with 40 or 50,000 miles on it for six or seven thousand dollars now. For my neighbor, the the school teacher, it's just been a terrific value of a car for her 11 mile daily commute. I mean, the fact that the car only has 80 miles of range is not a problem. Her husband's Forester uh, works fine for when they're going somewhere. Uh, and, you know, yeah, well, under that approach, she could pay the annual fee and then at the end of the year, show that she only drove 5,000 miles and get two thirds of it repainted. I think Mark's right that there's a lot of, of hybrid ideas that could work here uh, and, and that's available. All right, great, thank you. Um, so we're nearing the end of the, the hour here. So thank you for all the great questions so far. We have um, several more to get to, so we'll stay on the line um, for an additional 30 minutes. Just a quick revisit to our final um, takeaways here. The U.S. has experienced transportation funding shortfalls for decades, and EVs are just a tiny sliver of the problem. Fair cost recovery should be considering weight, width, and miles driven. And smart charging, rate design, and tax design can work together to provide an effective, efficient, and equitable solution. And transportation and electric system planners need to be coordinated to make this happen. So as I said, this is going to conclude the official portion of the web webinar. Our thanks to you for spending time with us today. And I'd also like to thank Karen, Mark, and Jim for their insights. And for those of you who would like to stay on, we will um, shortly here dive back into the questions that we've received. And please um, feel free to continue submitting them through your webinar platform. All right, so we have a few questions about um, political feasibility. And so I'm gonna pose this to whomever would like to take a stab at it. Um, are there any of the options that we've discussed today particularly feasible for states that have a strong aversion to taxes in general? That is, if you had to pick one of these options for a state that dislikes taxes, which one do you think has the most potential? Uh, do nothing. But electric vehicles use the road without charge. That, that's, that's for the tax averse state, that's uh, an easy solution. If I were to pick one 
that I think is easy to do for a state that doesn't want a complicated solution. It would probably be dollars per kilowatt hour of battery capacity in an annual fee. That's a administratively very simple thing to do within the vehicle registration. It provides some rough equity. You don't have to ask people how far they're driving. There's no in in vehicle device tracking your movement. It's just a, a registration fee that's in the example I gave 30 bucks for a plug in 72 for a, an early leaf and 225 for a Tesla. I guess I would also add that there have been, you know, many conversations uh, in the electric vehicle world about the need for electric vehicles to pay something uh, to deal with some of the perceived divide between EV owners who are sort of getting this for free uh, versus everyone else. So I think even in those states that are tax adverse. There's something around the the level playing field uh, for these vehicles and the need for EV drivers to pay something towards the maintenance of the system that is appealing. So I'm not sure that the tax aversion would go as far as suggesting that EV owners not pay anything. And I think EV owners and those that want to continue to see the electrification of the transportation sector recognize the importance of of that payment and of that being part of the the full system of paying for the roads okay um so we have a couple of questions around um the way that these options would impact different sort of groups of drivers or, or segments of society. Um, there's a question here that gives an example that in Pennsylvania, they're considering a bill that would strike the existing tax on electricity as a motor fuel because it's been unimplementable. And the state of Iowa recently adopted a per kilowatt hour tax that explicitly excluded residential charging, which is where we know the majority of all charging takes place. So how, how would something like that affect you know folks who live in multi-unit um, dwellings who do most of their charging at public facilities? Are there sort of issues with equity in implementing any of these options? Yeah, the, the Pennsylvania example is uh, really interesting. I remember several years ago doing uh, research on different systems and it was the only state that actually taxed electricity as we're speaking about. Uh, and yet they had found that maybe one person in the state actually submitted uh, their form because it was up to uh, each individual to track uh, their use or estimate it and send in uh, their payment to the state. Um, I, I, and so it, I think that that's sort of, if you want to talk about dumb charging, that go, takes it a, a level beyond uh, what even Jim was showing in terms of a, of a charging station. Um, so I, I think the issue of multi-unit dwellings and where people are charging in public gets to having one system that works everywhere. If it is a fee on electricity, it would apply whether you're doing it at a public charging or at home. Yeah, I, this is the reason in my presentation that I talked about the need to couple a roadway tax on the electricity uh, consumption with a smart rate design to get, have a large enough off-peak discount to be able to bear the road tax and still be attractive for the customer to choose the smart charger. And if we can get to that point, then the home chargers uh, can, uh, in order to be eligible for the off-peak discount, you have to have a smart charger. And so the mile, the kilowatt hours going into the vehicles can be reported and the tax remitted by the utility, not by the, uh, not by the the individual, the charge points and green lots and the other commercial blank and the the other commercial charging networks can incorporate that road tax into their fee structure, but also incorporate the off-peak charging discount into their fee structure. Uh, and a lot of the times the multi, you know, the apartment buildings are contracting with one of those operators to provide the charging solution on the property. 
and, and recover the cost of it uh, directly from the users uh, through their their payment networks and it can flow through through that. I think that the, the key is you need to have smart rate design, smart tax design, and smart chargers to make the electricity fee work. So you know, I, one thing that we, we haven't discussed and I think it's it's it fits in with this conversation is as we all know the gas tax is a flat fee regardless of your vehicle size, the miles you drive, the width, and your income. There's no progressivity built into to that. With the electricity fee, there are ways to add some of those progressive, you know, in terms of um, income elements. Many utilities have low and moderate income programs. There may be a way to include that component, uh, which I think is an important and valuable distinction from the flat gas tax that um, is regressive in nature. Yeah. So, oh, do you have something to add, Mark? Oh, sure. I, I mean, I, I think it's it's nice to set up administrative schemes that are easy to implement and enforce. Of course, if if a gas station chose not to send their gas taxes to the state, bad things would happen to them, though. Um, so, you know, there, there is another side to this. If the state wanted to, they, they have registration data that on all of their, their vehicles. Um, and there are ways, you know, lots of options between, between strict uh, penalties and, and voluntary approaches to try to encourage people to, to pay their, their fair share of taxes. Um, you know, that's, that's with my, my lawyer hat on very briefly. Staying with that um, theme that Karen raised, um, have we thought about how thinking about progressivity as a, um, a column on our matrix slide there, how, how would that affect the, the different options? How would they fare under a progressivity test? Well, progressivity has, has a lot of definitions. Uh, one is, does it support the deployment of lots of electric vehicles because that is essential to addressing the climate crisis. And the most progressive uh, approach in that regard is the one that about half of the states have now, which is to not charge electric vehicle users to use the roadway. Uh, progressivity can, can also mean, does it affect rich people differently than, than it affects poor people? Uh, we could add that. Uh, but while the early leaf is an extremely good value uh, for for a modest income uh, person with a with a reasonably short commute, uh, I, I think it's fair to say that at this point most electric vehicles are driven by above average income folks who can afford relatively new cars. Uh, there's just uh, Karen showed the the sales data. There's not that many old electric cars on the road. Uh, and the new ones are generally not cheap. Uh, but that's going to change over time. Uh, you know, the, 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 uh, the Chevy Bolts are, are going to come off lease uh, in another year and uh, start making it into the, into the used car market. Uh, and obviously, progressivity has a political connotation that uh, generally means whatever I believe is good and what you believe is not. Uh, and I'm, I'm not sure we can handle that that definition of progressivity uh, in any matrix. Anyone else want to add? Um, this, Jim, you may have covered this sufficiently already, and if so, um, feel free to just tell me that. But here's a question about not all jurisdictions um, favoring a technology-specific time of use rate or technology-specific um, tax. How could imposing a per kilowatt hour tax on just EV charging potentially hinder the deployment of non-residential EV charging infrastructure? Um, I don't think it's uh, uh, charging three cents a kilowatt hour uh, on non-residential uh, commercial charging solutions. I don't think is going to be. A, a significant barrier. Uh, 
you know, blink in my community charges 49 cents a kilowatt hour for electricity. Uh, and, you know, and, and the utility they're buying it from sells it to them for a dime. Uh, so they, they should be able to implement an on-peak, off-peak rate that has enough differential in it, uh, getting a on-peak, off-peak rate from the utility that the three cents would mostly disappear in the off-peak discount. Uh, and you'd wind up with an on-peak surcharge uh, that's a, a few cents and an off-peak discount that's quite a few cents. Uh, but it, it, it's, you know, it, it's an issue that those companies uh, will weigh in on. They won't like the idea of having to remit a tax. None of us do. Uh, but uh, if, if we, as, as, as a group of EV users and clean energy uh, supporters and utility regulators think that it's equitable to have electric vehicles pay, pay for roads, then one of these solutions needs to be selected. And as I said, it may be that they, uh, the annual fee based on battery capacity is the one that has the most political uh, feasibility. Mm -hmm. Okay, um, Mark, here's a clarifying question for some of the things you talked about. Um, does WIP really have an ongoing cost like weight does? Um, roads obviously need to be built wider for wider vehicles, but once they're built, um, the wider car doesn't cause more maintenance costs. Is that correct? Well, sure, but I think there's a, sh a short run, long run issue. You know, uh, planning, zoning, road building is is a continual process. Um, you know, the turnover can be very slow, but you know, if if cars all of a sudden became smaller. Maybe you could have uh, ex smaller driving lanes and extra room for parking or extra room for a bike lane. So there's a lot of different elements to it. Um, and I think we would encourage people to, to think broadly and in long term about it rather than, you know, in the next year, the width isn't going to drive any differential maintenance costs. Mm -hmm. Okay. Um... Karen, I'll pose this one to you. Um, do, do you have any thoughts on how uh, to incentivize pooling of vehicle use? Um, so multiple riders in the same car, that seems super critical to both reducing greenhouse gas emissions and reducing the wear and tear on the roads. Yeah, I mean, I think as we consider ways to reduce vehicle miles traveled, whether they're electric or uh, fossil fuel powered, uh, pooling is an absolutely critical component to that. Um, I'm not sure in terms of whether it's an electric vehicle um, that may speak to, you know, what's not included in the weight distance miles is occupancy of the vehicle. Getting to those data of how many occupants are in a vehicle and then charging uh, in that manner is probably a little more per, might be seen as even more invasive than uh, than the VM than the vehicle miles traveled uh, tax that Jim spoke about. Um, but I think the the occupancy and finding ways to credit um, beyond the high occupancy vehicle lanes that you see in in many states, uh, there should be some way to consider that. I don't know if if Jim or or Mark have some thoughts about how to add a column on occupancy. Well, I, I have some thoughts on, on this, the pooling issue, which is if you keep the costs of driving volumetric, that is per mile or, uh, you know, in proportion to how much you drive, uh, which a fuel tax does and a annual fixed fee does not do, then you're telling people that they can save money, more money by pooling. And so the... And, there's the Victoria Transport Policy Institute is probably the leading thinker on how to to reduce uh, VMT. Uh, and the two things that could easily be volumetric. Uh, one is insurance pay by the mile. Uh, and, and there are a number of companies out there that are off specifically targeting drivers who drive few miles. 
uh, but pay, pay, pay by, by the mile insurance. Uh, 20 years ago, we, we called it pay at the pump, but uh, that's, you know, the, the pump is uh, looking a lot like an electric outlet for many of us these days. Uh, but if you can have insurance and roadway cost recovery be volumetric, that drives up the cost per mile of driving as opposed to an annual fixed fee for car, for insurance and an annual fixed fee for, for roadway cost recovery. Uh, and if the per mile cost of driving is higher, people are gonna be more likely to pool. And then there's also a number of places have, you know, waived tolls for multi-occupant vehicles on, on bridges. The California Oakland Bay Bridge has been that way for, for a long time. Uh, and for, for a while, when it first started, there was such a traffic congestion and cost premium that people were actually making a living hitchhiking back and forth across the bridge to provide people an extra person, uh, which torturing the, the concept a little bit, but uh, all of the waiving of fees for multi-occupant vehicles, whether it's tolling or parking, uh, are, are, are terrific tools to enable pooling. It's got nothing, those have nothing to do with whether the vehicle's electric or not. Um, yeah, I have one extra thought on that. With, with enough data and enforcement capability, you can, you can adjust your fees for basically anything. Uh, you know, how you, how you get that is another, another question, and often that can be politically controversial. One area where some states are, are, are getting that type of data is from ride-sharing companies. Uh, Massachusetts has some data sharing requirements between the ride-sharing companies and, and the state. Um, so you could fairly easily implement different different fees or taxes for you know, single occupancy uh, rides and, and multi-person rides. Um, so you know, if, if you have the data, you could, you could do a lot. Uh, whether that becomes controversial is a, another matter. Okay. Um, Mark or Jim, for state road taxation, um, would we want to have some ability to use GPS, for example, to track road use to identify what portions are traveled on which state's roads, particularly relevant for people who you know, live close to the border of one state, but maybe they work in one state and live in another. That was a terrific solution for 1984, but I'm not sure people want Big Brother watching them that closely. <laughs> yeah, well, I mean, it's funny. I almost brought this up in response to the last question, but I, I had some good friends who drafted a bill in a state that would implement a VMT fee that was adjusted for weight, width, vehicle efficiency, income of the driver, and the, how clean the vehicle was. So at, at that rate, you're collecting basically all sorts of extra personal information, and this is perfectly well-intentioned, um, but you know, it's, at some point, people's patience with that sort of stuff is gonna, is gonna run out. So um, if, if, you, if you have the data, you can, you can do anything and adjust for any characteristics you want. Um, the question is, what, what's the, how how strongly do you do you want that data, and and how how would people feel about it? Yeah. Uh, the amount the, the beauty of the gasoline tax is really in its simplicity and the difficulty in evading it. Uh, there's just not a lot of things that we do with gasoline other than put it in our vehicles, uh, and our boats and our airplanes. Uh, but the places that you put it in boats are generally different from the places you put it in vehicles. Uh, most of us who have gasoline lawnmowers wind up paying road tax on our lawnmower fuel. But states do estimate how much of that fuel is going to non-highway use. And some of them uh, appropriate a portion of that money away. But from a taxing perspective, it's very simple. The, the tax gets imposed at a fairly central point of delivery on the petroleum system, and it's hard to evade and easy to collect. Uh, and uh, emulating that for electricity is going to be challenging, uh, but we think it's it's possible as we move to to smart rates and smart tax design and smart charging. Uh, collecting a lot of additional data. I personally think will be very intrusive, uh, and I think will be uh, a challenge. 
a couple and of, of course, questions. the other the other main distinction between gasoline and electricity is by and large, no one can generate their own gasoline while some folks can generate their own electricity with solar. So that becomes another interesting um, link there as well. So we have a couple other questions about um, implementation of this electricity tax idea. Um, so it's sort of a questions about uh, how to collect it. And here's one, what are the barriers that need to be addressed to enable the utility to start being the source of transportation user fees? Or would it be some other entity that it would oversee that distribution of the tax to the highway fund, such as the Public Utility Commission? Well, I don't think it'd be the Public Utility Commission because 25% of the customers are served by unregulated. Uh, public power or cooperative utilities. So I think it needs to be imposed at the state level. Uh, most states do impose taxes on electricity. All of the electricity utilities do remit those taxes to the state. In my state, it's a 4% public utility excise tax. In addition, in my state, cities impose a tax on electricity. In my city, it's a 9% electricity tax. The utility remits that directly to the city. Uh, and so I, I think we would use the same framework that states already have in place for electric utilities remitting tax revenue. The difference would be uh, to uh, uh, impose on them the obligation to uh, collect data on uh, electric vehicle charging component of that. Uh, and there should probably be some default mechanism that gets imposed if they don't come up with a smart charging and and data collection uh, that gets more specific data. Okay, um, I'm not sure who to toss this to, so I'll let you decide. Um, have this is a question about um, plug-in hybrid vehicles and whether battery dependent, uh, battery size dependent fees have been instituted anywhere in the U.S. Um, and are there any solutions that are fair uh, for, for plug-in hybrids so that we aren't double charging or overcharging plug-in hybrids for, for roadway costs? Um, I drive a plug-in hybrid, a Kia Nero, so I, I've, I've paid a lot of attention to this question. Yes, there are a number of states that have, have imposed fees on plug-in hybrids. Washington and Oregon uh, uh, passed legislation this, legislative, so this past legislative session. Uh, to do that, the uh, Washington fee on a plug-in is one-third the fee on uh, a battery electric vehicle. That's seventy-five dollars versus two twenty-five, uh, and uh, so there, it's not based on battery size. It's just generically on plug-in hybrid. Uh, in Washington State, it's if the vehicle has thirty miles of driving range or more. For over 30 miles of driving range, it is classified as a full electric and pays a very high fee. And if it's classified as a plug-in with 30 miles or less of range, uh, it uh, pays a lower fee. And uh, my, my Nero is 26 and the Prius Prime is 28 or 29 and the uh, Ionique is 29. Uh, and they all pay the lower, we all pay the lower fee and the Chrysler Pacifica uh, plug-in is 31, and uh, and obviously the Chevy Volt was uh, in the 40-plus range, uh, and they would pay the higher fee. Uh, that's one of the reasons my experience with that is why I put in our matrix the idea of a dollars per year per kilowatt hour of battery capacity uh, charge, and, and it wouldn't need to be uniform. It could be, you know, five dollars a kilowatt hour on the first ten, and and three dollars a kilowatt hour after that, to reflect the fact that the uh, the, the plug-ins, our plug-in, you know, all our driving around town is electric, uh, and only when we take it out on the road do we start burning gasoline. So you, you get maybe fifty percent of the EV petroleum avoidance benefit with. 20% of the battery investment. Uh, so it, 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 what states know how to tax vehicles differentially and, and uh, the dollars per kilowatt hour of capacity I selected because it's 
knowable from the vehicle registration data. It's unambiguous. It would be easy to administer, uh, and it would, if it could be roughly, uh, roughly fair to all sizes of electric vehicles, uh, reflecting that the, the wider, heavier, and more driven vehicles need generally need the bigger batteries. Okay. This again, this could be for any of you. Um, it's a little bit of a, a different topic, but um, still interesting. Are we aware of any electric utilities considering tariffed on bill financing for um, things like electric transit or school or fleet buses? I am not. I'm not, and my gut reaction is that it's probably not a good idea because transit agencies are public agencies and can sell tax exempt bonds or use tax exempt certificates of participation for financing, which are a lower cost of financing than any uh, investor owned or co op utility could conceivably have access to. So they would transit agencies and school districts for school buses would have access to much lower costs of capital than a utility. Uh, for municipal utilities, and there are some municipalities that operate their own transit networks, that might be quite different. And if the municipal utility could sell tax exempt bonds and, and do on bill financing to the municipal uh, transit agency, that, that might be a possibility, but there's, that's a pretty small sliver of the market. I think the, co the cost of capital is just lower for, for transit operators to do it directly. Okay, well, we have time for maybe one or two more questions. Um, here's one again about the implementation. Um, a lot of cooperatives use uh, a billing system, but where the member, um, if they have a net meter adding, adding more data from a separate EV charger, that can make billing problematic on the same account. Um, any thoughts on how to get past that other than just needing to do a lot of programming in the charger or in the billing system? For the small utilities that have unique billing systems, as a, uh, it's going to, it, I, I don't have an easy solution. For the small utilities that use a billing system that's supported by one of the major vendors of uh, meter data management systems and, and, and billing engines, uh, their vendors should be able to provide that solution to them pretty economically. And maybe just a, a similar sort of implementation question, Jim, if we used kilowatt hours consumed by an EV for road funding, would that or, or how might that complicate potential ancillary services that could be provided by bi-directional chargers, if at all? Uh, I wrote a paper on this topic uh, that's available on our website, distribution pricing with distributed energy resources. And the simple answer is that the smart charger that can provide ancillary services would get a separate $10 a month credit uh, from the ISO or whoever is buying the ancillary services that would have nothing to do with the number of kilowatt hours that flow through uh, that on which road taxes do. Uh, ancillary services typically don't involve a, a, a meaningful number of kilowatt hours uh, across across the month and, and you would simply have, uh, as, as utilities are doing now with smart inverters that are providing ancillary services uh, from solar systems, you simply provide a, a monthly bill credit for, for of some kind for the services. It's either uh, a flat dollar amount or, or a more complicated amount. And the paper talks about four different ways to, to provide those kinds of, uh, of, of credits to distributed re energy resources that are providing uh, grid support services. Okay, great. Thanks, Jim. And um, we are nearing the end of our extra 30 minutes here. Um, so just to remind you all, a recording of the webinar along with our presentation will be available on our website and we'll be sending that to you by email. Um, when you leave this webinar, you're gonna see a three question survey pop up. We would greatly appreciate any feedback you have for us on today's 
webinar. Um, I want to just quickly thank Karen, Mark, and Jim again for your insights and for sticking around for the extra question time. And thank you all so much for your interest in our in our webinar today. And we hope you have a, a great rest of your afternoon. Thanks, Jess. Thanks, everyone. Thanks, everybody. Thank you. Bye-bye.